Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and I'm a little bit late on this one. I've had a, a very busy December and January from a personal uh, perspective, and so I haven't had as much time to delve into these lists and sort of year-end activities as I would like. Um, you know, the, just just a lot going on. But we are to that point. Uh, we, we, we are past that point, but I did want to talk about my top strategy and war games of 2020. So this is actually going to be a two-part episode. This is episode number one, uh, which is going to be focusing on my top five strategy games of 2020. Uh, and shortly, there will be another video that will come up that will uh, talk about my top five war games of 2020. Now, strategy and war games are often interlinked or interconnected topics. So the, the, the line between a war game and a strategy game is sometimes fuzzy. Most war games tend to be strategy games, but not all strategy games tend to be war games. And then a lot of strategy games tend to have warlike themes, but may not truly be a war game. And so I guess, you know, this was, at the end of the day, this came down to there were 10 games that came out this year or last year that I really wanted to talk about and sort of my top games of the year list. And I didn't want to do a top 10 list. I've never done a top 10 list. I've always done top five lists. I feel like if you do a list of 10, you either can't say enough about the game or you, because you'll, you have to rush through it to cover so many games in, in one video, or you have to, um, make a absurdly long video that that's hard to follow. And so for that reason, I've split the list sort of down the middle of what I consider war games and strategy games, but your definitions may differ. I've been talking about this for two minutes already, so we're going to jump in in one sec. I will add the caveat that I can only talk about games that I played. These are my personal opinions for the top games of the year, but Obviously, if I didn't play a game or if I didn't play a lot of a game, then maybe it deserved to be on the list and isn't. So, for example, one game that I know a lot of people raved about this year that I didn't really get a ton of time in is Shadow Empire, which is a space 4X war game, a turn-based war game, by VR Designs, and also it's published by Slytherin. And again, this is a game that a lot of my friends, fellow YouTubers, absolutely loved and spent a ton of time in. Uh, we even did an interview for our podcast with the developer, but I only got a couple of hours in the game, and it wasn't a game that I felt I had put enough time into or or whatnot to include it on a list. And so there's going to be gaps in here. There's going to be games you agree or don't agree with, but just keep that in mind. Obviously, any list like this is incredibly subjective. With that being said, that's enough sort of of the intro. Let's go ahead and jump in. This video is going to be my top five strategy games of 2020. At number five on my list is Command and Conquer Remastered Collection. Now, I know technically this isn't a new release. This is a, a remaster of two, or I guess technically multiple games, but uh, the first two Command and Conquers and the relevant expansions, uh, which came out in the 1990s, so obviously quite a long time ago. Command and Conquer 1 came out in 1995, and Command and Conquer 2, uh, Red Alert, came out in 1996. So these are 25, 24 year old games that came out uh, in 2020, but in a remastered version. The reason I'm including it on this list is because if you haven't played the originals, or if you have, they're very well done uh, remasters, and these to this day remain some of the best RTS games ever made. Sort of traditional RTS games that are built around base building, sort of optimizing your force structure, and destroying your opposition, which is also on the map. These are a true joy to play. And frankly, what always drew them to me, or what always drew me to them were the campaigns they had. I was never really competitive into like trying to play other people or trying to play the AI or anything like that. That was never really my thing, but I, I absolutely loved the campaign games. I didn't play a lot of Command & Conquer 1. Um, I played a little bit of it. I think I rented it from like Best Buy. This is dating myself a bit, but I think I played it uh, a little bit from renting it from Best Buy on my sister's Nintendo 64. Uh, these games are also on console. But I did play a lot of Command & Conquer Red Alert, which is Command & Conquer 2, which is also in this remaster collection. 
Um, and I played that on PlayStation. And I think one of the things that everybody remembers from the series, especially sort of these early games in the series, were these really corny, over-the-top sort of full motion videos that were recorded between the battles and and are just an absolute uh I I think they're an absolute joy to watch. They're they're funny, they're um kind of ridiculous at the same time uh and uh and they really do add a lot to the campaign and how they st- tell the story. Now the gameplay itself is solid. Uh, Obviously, it's a bit dated from an RTS perspective because the game is 25 years old, but I highly recommend you check it out. It's it's a game that I've revisited a bit, a little bit on the channel, not a ton. Um, And it's definitely a game that I think, you know, if you were if you were taking a look at the top five games, uh, top five strategy games of 2020 and you were going to say, like, what should you go back and spend some time on? What should you check out that maybe you missed? Uh, I definitely think Command and Conquer Remastered Collection is on that list. Uh, even though, again, it's a remastered game. At number four on my list of top five strategy games of 2020 is ICBM, which is a game that is developed by Soft War Wear. Uh, it's also part of the K Project uh, by Slytherin Limited, which is sort of a program where Slytherin works with uh, small developers to try and help make their games come into reality. And this is a real-time uh, DEFCON-like uh, strategy game where you are basically in, char- in charge of uh, a continent uh, and you are trying to win a nuclear arms race and eventually a nuclear struggle against the other opponents in the or on the map. Now, this might be the first game on the list and, and maybe really the only game on the list that could go either way as being a strategy or a war game. But I did include it on this list because to me it feels much more like a typical RTS. You could take it out of its context and put it into any other sort of context, and I think it would very well fit very well as an RTS game as opposed to um, you know a, a war game. Um, but basically, in this game, you start off with a very small amount of points that you can allocate toward airfields or bombers or aircraft carriers or nuclear weapons, and you use those points to sort of pick your initial starting dispositions, but then in real time, you're thrown onto a map, one of seven different uh, continents, although there's different maps with different numbers of, uh, of players on the map. And then you essentially have to prioritize your production or your research. And so you kind of have a budget, if you will, or a, a capacity, if you will, that you can allocate toward researching new weapon systems, both offensive and defensive. So you've got defensive weapon systems like SAM sites, which can be upgraded to have anti-ballistic missiles or just high, you know, very advanced SAMs to shoot down enemy bombers. Or you can focus on offensive systems that are like ICBMs or submarine-launched ballistic missiles, or um, you, or what are what are some other ones? Um, some medium-range ballistic missiles, etc. To to focus on your offensive strategy, and so you kind of have to balance. First off, you have to balance your budget in order. In, you know, in what percentage of your your budget are you going to allocate to research or building? Then you have to allocate sort of your your research preference. Are you going offensive minded, defensive minded, or something kind of in between? And then you have to sort of lay out your plan to build your forces up. And those allocations will typically shift over time, right? Like you might start off more heavy on research, but as you research things, at some point you gotta start building. And it's sort of always unfolding as you as you build up, as you try to counter what the AI might be doing to figure out ways to penetrate their defenses. You can also engage the AI or humans, depending on who you're playing against, with conventional forces. But then as soon as someone launches that first nuke, as soon as that first nuke is out of out of a silo, it's basically clock gets gets tricked and now it is time to just pound the enemy and do your best in an all-out nuclear conflict. Again, it's very much like DEF CON in a lot of ways, but it's got more depth. It has a wide variety of units of tech uh, sort of research items, a wide variety of strategies. This game feels incredibly well balanced. It supports online and AI play. I highly recommend it. I think it is well worth your time. I haven't put enough time into it, but the time that I have put into it, I've really enjoyed. And I think this is one of the best, most well-rounded, most balanced uh, games that I played this year 
And uh, I think, you know, it, it, it shines in multiplayer. If it has one weakness, it's that I, I'm not sure how compelling the single player experience will be once you've tried out different strategies against the AI a few times. Um, there's not a huge variety of map types. There's not a huge, there's really not many scenarios, if any. So I do think the single player experience suffers. But if you're looking for a really entertaining multiplayer sort of competitive RTS, um, that's sort of set in this nuclear sort of Cold War type era. Uh, I think this is a, a game that's well worth your time, and I highly recommend checking out again. At number four, it's ICBM, uh, published by Slytherin and developed by Soft War Wear. So if you haven't checked it out, uh, there will be some links in the description to videos that I've done on these games, and obviously you've seen the footage here in front of you, but I highly recommend you check it out. At number three on my list is a game by Torpor Games and published by Fellow Traveler. And it's a game that you guys have seen a lot on the channel of lately. And that is Suzerain, a text-based role-playing political game that has a lot of love and care behind it. It's a really interesting game. Again, I've been sort of showing it on the channel a lot lately, but... If you haven't been watching those videos, in essence, Suzerain is a game where you play the role of Anton Rain, who is a recently elected president to a 1950s country that would probably fall into like a developing nation sort of uh, a description. It's a country that has been in the recent past racked by civil war. It is trying to uh, come back from a period of quasi-dictatorial rule. There's democratic elections, but there's a very strong central government, a very strong elected uh, president. And just a few terms prior, there was a quasi-dictator who was, you know, elected a bunch of times, but was basically the only game in con only game in town. And so you're dealing with a lot of these issues that are really challenging to sort of navigate your way through. You're dealing with a serious economic recession. You're dealing with a cold war between sort of Western capitalistic powers and Eastern powers, and you're sort of stuck in the middle, all while having a very bellicose wannabe superpower neighbor for a, for a, uh, an adversary on your border, and dealing with a lot of the challenges of, you know, do you want to go down the capitalist route and try to open up your economy and your, your open up free market? Or do you want to go down the, you know, communist route and keep strong state control? Or do you want to sort of find a middle ground? All the time that this is going on, this isn't really a political simulation in that sense. It's much more of a role-playing game because while all of this is going on, Really, this game is about managing your relationships with your cabinet, with your family, with the different uh, diplomatic envoys or, or leaders who you meet over the course of your time in power. And so it's a really interesting game that I think is beautifully done. It's essentially a visual novel. I don't know how many of you have played visual novel type games in the past, but it's basically a choose-your-own-adventure visual novel type role-playing game. And in a lot of ways, it's sort of a throwback to, to games of many years ago because it's all text-based. You know, you, you have maps, you have some graphics, you know, some images, but really it's fundamentally a text-based game. And I have really adored this game. You know, I think in terms of the amount of time and effort that they put into it, the backstories, the fully fleshed political parties and characters, the you know paragraph-long write-up for characters who you might run into once in the course of the game, it feels a lot deeper. It doesn't feel linear. Apparently, it has like nine different potential endings, so it has quite a few different directions things can go. And I think it's really well done. My understanding is one of the developers actually worked on the Hearts of Iron 3 Black Ice mod, which is a very well-regarded, sort of the definitive mod of Hearts of Iron 3. But I think just, you know, the, the amount of care that they put into the story and the variability and the fact that your choices really do matter really makes this a game that I think is really special and also innovative, right? Like, it may not have all the pretty graphics of a lot of games nowadays, but it doesn't need to. I think it tells a great story and it really, you know, immerses you in the experience and, and lets you really feel like you are this character going through these different events. And, and for that, I think it's very well done and it's easily 
on my list of top five games at coming in at number three for my third uh, best strategy game of 2020. There's no question it's a strategy game. It's just a little bit different than a lot of the ones out there. With that being said, if you haven't checked it out, there is a link in the description. I highly recommend you check this uh, game out. The game is Suzerain, uh, again, and it is developed by Torpor Games and Fellow Traveler. As I already said, it has a very positive uh, review status on Steam of 1,077 reviews. It is marked as very positive, and in the 334 recent uh, reviews, it is overwhelmingly positive. So it seems like a lot of people have a similar opinion and experience with this game. But that's enough of me raving about this thing. Let's go ahead and move on to my second, uh, my, my number two game of 2020. Coming in at number two on my top five strategy games of 2020 is a game called Yes, Your Grace. The game is developed by Brave at Night. It is published by No More Robots. And I'm sensing kind of a trend as I'm talking through this list now at this point. And it seems like a lot of the games on my list might qualify as almost like indies. Now, that's not true of every game. It's definitely not true of the number one game on my list. But I did find myself playing a lot of games this year that are from smaller studios and that are kind of a little bit more adventure kind of role-playing. Now, in the case of Yes, Your Grace, you are the king of a sort of medieval uh, kingdom in uh, a fantasy world. It, it, it's kind of a, it, you know, it's it's almost got like Game of Thrones like vibes in terms of, you know, it's not overtly fantasy, but there is magic involved. There are spells involved. Uh, they're not central to the story, but it is definitely sort of a, a magical world. Now, in this game, it is... First off, the art in this game is gorgeous. I love the art style. Essentially, the way the game works is you are a king of this this kingdom. Uh, you are beset by problems, and essentially you sit in this throne every, every day or every turn or whatnot, and people come to you with questions, with requests, and you have to decide what you're going to do for those requests. So basically, someone might come to you because... Uh, you know, a bandit slaughtered their, their pig and, and they want uh, some help tracking the bandit down or uh, they want you to uh, help them get back on their feet because without the pig, they'll go bankrupt or something like that. Maybe they're a farmer and or like a cow would work better like if they were dependent on the milk or something like that. And then you have to make the decision. You know, one of the options you might be able to go with is, all right, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to uh, prosecute this guy, or I'm not going to, you know, waste military resources potentially on trying to help you out here, but I'll give you a little bit of cash in order to get you back on your feet. Another option might be to send them on their way and say, you know, this isn't really the, <laughs> this isn't really something that rises to the standard of what the king cares about. Um, and a lot of times those characters will return and, and have sort of a follow on effect. And so, if you don't take care of your people, it can come back to hurt you. Also, you know, you're a king who doesn't have a male heir. You have two daughters uh, who are always sort of running around the castle causing problems. Uh, your youngest daughter has this, you know, fascination with really weird pets that actually is pretty central to the story. And your older daughter is is kind of a uh, a bit of a, a bit of a troublemaker, a bit of a free spirit. You know, um, she. Uh, wants to go off and adventure and, and uh, travel the world, perhaps. But it's it's really interesting sort of seeing these dynamics and, and sort of you and your wife, obviously, the queen, are, are trying to have an heir. And so um, there's really interesting scenes, really well done art. The music fits the mood perfectly. And the story is pretty interesting with outside threats looming against the kingdom uh, that you kind of have to deal with. And, you know, there's, there are, op and I'm trying not to give too much away because I think this is definitely, even though, you know, the game came out in March of 2020, this is probably, this is the closest uh, release to 2019. I get the furthest ago, but I do remember playing it and I really enjoyed it. And uh, I definitely think it's worth picking up. It, it seems to have very positive reviews on Steam. Uh, it's got a very positive uh, review right now with over 4,188 uh, responses uh, and the recent reviews are very positive as well so 
you know, I don't know how much replayability there is. It, it does have some visual novel type characteristics. There are different endings. Your choices can lead to different outcomes for both the ending of the game, but also your characters individually. Uh, and so, again, both this and Suzerain kind of have a visual novel type feel to it. Now, yes, your grace is not entirely text-based. There are strategic maps. There are decisions you make about allocating resources. Uh, the art style of the characters is very well done. There's quite a bit of humor mixed in as well. Um, you know, I, I don't want to go on too long about this, but this is this is a game that I think there's a fair bit you may not have seen with it, but I highly recommend you checking it out. Um, again, I got very much sort of Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones type vibes from this game, and uh, it's it's adorable. I love it. So recommend you check it out. At number two on my list for top five strategy games of 2020 is Yes, Your Grace. And coming in at number one, my top strategy game of 2020, Crusader Kings 3. Developed by Paradox Development Studio and published by Paradox Interactive, Crusader Kings 3 is the sequel to, you guessed it, Crusader Kings 2. Uh, in Crusader Kings 3, you are the head of a dynasty or of a family in the Middle Ages with an option to start in either 866, or sorry, 867, or 1066, and able to play until 1453, the historical date of the fall of Constantinople. This is a game that I've spent a lot of time in, in already and will likely continue to be playing over the years. If the development pattern of Crusader Kings 2 is any indication, we will be getting DLCs for this game for, oh gosh, probably close to a decade. And frankly, I'm really excited to see where this game and this franchise goes. I think this might have been the most well done and complete Paradox game at release in as long as I can remember. And uh, I, I mean, I just, I think this is just a tremendous game all around. If you're unfamiliar with Crusader Kings, essentially the concept in this game is you are the head of a family in the Middle Ages, and your goal is to essentially increase your influence and your power while also sort of spreading your dynasty throughout medieval Europe and uh, and parts of Asia and Africa to expand your influence and you know build a dynasty to last the ages I mean I guess the the historical comparison would probably be your goal is to be the Habsburgs or something like that where you know you're you're spreading all throughout throughout Europe I think it's a really interesting and different kind of a game, right? Like, if you've played other Paradox games, EU, Europea Universalis, is fundamentally about building a imperial empire. Hearts of Iron is about waging World War II and, and you know, just, just basically dominating the world uh, and winning the Second World War and either, you know, expanding uh, the, the Axis powers or defeating them and setting yourself up for success in the post-war world. Victoria is about, um, you know, again, kind of building an imperial empire, but in the age of the industrial age. So EU is pre-industrial or, you know, er to early industrial, and Victoria is about the industrial age. All of those games, though, are about running countries. They're not about running families. I think the closest thing you probably get to running families is some of the stuff in EU4. But CK is a game about families. It's about interpersonal drama. It's about, you know, plotting against your, you know, your hated rival. It's about, you know, maybe your son is a is a massive disappointment, but you're, you know, you have someone else in the line of succession who would be much better for the family. I mean, you it, basically if you think to like Game of Thrones, you're Tywin Lannister. You're the scheming head of the household that's trying to do what is in your interest, but also in your family's interest. So again, you can continue to build those alliances, expand your power, grow your reach, grow your influence, all at the same time dealing with the reality of the Middle Ages, which is a, a era that is you know, highly religious, whether you're leading a Catholic crusader kingdom, whether you're leading an Eastern Orthodox kingdom, or a Muslim, uh, you know, caliphate or kingdom in the Middle East, you know, you, you have to deal with religion as well. And so it's about currying favor with your heads of your faith. It's about 
incurring favor with your family members. It's about marrying your children off so that you can expand your reach and your influence. This isn't an era where two kingdoms come together and say, we want to be allies because it's in our best interest. That can happen a little bit in the game, but not really very much. It's a game about you know, tying kingdoms together via blood, via, via family ties, via marriages. And all of this is going on, but the game is really, in many ways, a storytelling device, a role-playing device, where the core of what I think draws a lot of people to this game is not just painting the map your kingdom's colors. It is about the decisions and the relationships that you build, the betrayals that you make, the uh, people who betray and plot against you. It is a game about relationships. And I think that's what really sets it apart. That's what really makes it unique. And this game, you know, when Crusader Kings 2 came out, I covered it on this channel and I played it on this channel. It was the first Crusader Kings game that I played. But it was, to me, a game that felt incomplete when it came out. At the time it came out, I believe you basically only had like Catholic nations represented. You had a lot of different like kingdom types or nation types that you couldn't really play as, or if you could, it was really stripped down and felt incomplete. Um, this game, playing as an Orthodox, playing as a Catholic country, it feels complete. Playing as a Muslim country, I can see areas where maybe they'll expand or build things out, but it feels complete. I think, you know, some of my initial complaints are that the 867 start date tends to leave Byzantium a little bit too strong and it tends to blob a little bit too much and I don't know that there's enough breaks on it. I also think that there are definitely areas that they can focus, that they can enhance, that they can they, they can build out and make more compelling. But I don't see any glaring gaps to say like this doesn't work, I can't play the game, it feels, you know, neutered. This is a tremendously well done game at release. And, you know, I can't wait to see what they're going to do with DLC. But overall, this is, you know, this is the sequel that, that CK2 needed. CK2 was one of the real first mainstream successes for Paradox. Paradox Interactive is no longer a small studio. Ten years ago, they were not a huge studio. But they are no longer a small studio. They've got, like, 250-plus employees now between the publishing branch and the development branch. Um, you know, they publish games, but they also make their own games. This is one of them. But it's no longer a small studio. This is a, you know, a multi-million dollar company. They have a number of games that have sold over a million copies. CK2 has sold over a million copies. Uh, Cities Skyline, which is a game they publish, has sold well over a million copies. Um, I believe EU4 and uh, Hearts of Iron 4 have as well. But CK2 was really that first real break, break into the mainstream, my perception anyway. I think a lot of it had to do with modders and some of the, you know, the Game of Thrones mods that came out at the time. But you know, this is, I think what we're seeing in CK3 is sort of a culmination of Paradox taking a step back and saying, we need deep gameplay mechanics that are compelling. We want to tell stories with the game, but they've also leveraged some of the, the uh, streamlining and tremendous work they've done on user interfaces in some of their other newer games, uh, like Hearts of Iron 4 or like Imperator. Um, and so I think you see sort of a blend of the old and the new paradox in this game in a way that is really compelling and well done. So overall, I think CK3 is a great game. I am you know, absolutely enjoying my time with it. I think you'll see a lot more of it. I don't know if we'll post a ton more on the channel uh, on YouTube, but but I will certainly be streaming it on Twitch. Um, you know, it's 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 here to stay, and I think there's no question in my mind that this was, of all the strategy games that I played, that this was the best strategy game of 2020. So that's my list. Uh, we have... Command and Conquer Remastered Edition at five. We have ICBM at number four, Suzerain at number three, Yes Your Grace at number two, and Crusader Kings three coming in at number one. What are your what are your top games of 2020? What are you, what are the strategy games that you think I missed? I'm sure we have different opinions. Please leave those down in the chat below. I'm curious to see what you all think. And uh, until next time, uh, when we will be talking about my top five war games of 2020, I hope you guys all have a great start to the year. It's hard to believe that we're already almost a tw you know one twelfth of the way. We're already through one month almost of 2020 or 2021. 
and I'm just coming out with this list. So stay safe. Uh, if you're if you're like me and you're in a cold climate, stay warm. And uh, until next time, guys, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, as always, I'm out.